Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the People Solve Problems podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Flinchball. And today we have with us John McCullough from uh, Director of Continuous Improvement from Sharp Services. Uh, I've known John quite a long time, but um, he's passionate about continuous improvement, leadership, strategy, and has opportunities to apply this every day. So, John, welcome and thanks for joining. Thank you for having me, Jamie. So uh, you have a lot of practical experience, a lot of uh, leading others in problem solving and improvement work uh, with, with lots of different continuous improvement roles. So, so let's just get into your, your process for problem solving. How, how would you describe your, your problem solving process sort of beginning to end? Okay, so I think one of the first things uh, that almost comes before whether you call it as part of the problem solving process itself or shortly before that is uh, making sure that we're not biting off more than we can chew. In other words, I think it's really uh, a natural trap that senior leaders can fall into is wanting to solve the world hunger size problems. And so really the first thing I do is say, is this problem small enough for a team of people to work on? And if not, then I need to lead people through okay, let's break this pro this big problem down into something smaller before we even really get into really strong problem definition. Uh, so that would be the next step is let's define a problem and get a really strong problem statement. Uh, hopefully there is either data or we have an action item to go and get data so that we can end up with a measurable problem that we can go after and then get into why the problem is happening. And I think there's a little bit of art to how deep do you go? Uh, you need to go deep enough to get to something that's actionable and something that is going to ultimately improve your problem. But you don't want to go so deep that you start getting into laws of nature or physics or uh, some of the stuff. Uh, there's been, you know, times where I had such an extensive root cause map that you almost feel like Alice in Wonderland and you, you kind of forget where you're at. So uh, once we get to root causes, then we just need to align brainstorming. Uh, this is something that I think also people sometimes struggle with is uh, the brainstorming aspect. People have their favorite countermeasure. They may have had that in their back pocket since we started defining the problem. And that's great that they're so passionate about it. But at the end of the day, uh, doing and conducting really good brainstorming. Uh, no idea is a bad idea when you're doing brainstorming. And so taking people through brainstorming to get all the possible potentials onto the table and then selecting from them. Uh, and then we, you know, conduct experiments. So what do we expect when we do some, when we implement something and then did we get it or did we not get it? And if we got the result that we're looking for, well, then the next question is, how do we make sure we keep getting it? So how do we implement measures that ensure that that sticks? And if it doesn't work, well, then we can still celebrate, which might sound counterintuitive. We should still be celebrating because we learned something. We learned something that doesn't work. And then we can reflect and say, did we not get what we expected because of some confounding factors or did we not get the result just because it wasn't a good uh, idea, mm -hmm. but we learned something that didn't work uh, and then continue on from there. Uh, that's a whole lot of great nuggets in there. And I, I recently used the phrase, um, I think I made it up on the spot, but you know, we had a results failure, but a learning success. <laughs> and um you know, sometimes you know that's, that's okay. Yeah, we didn't we didn't get done what we needed to, but we learned something and can uh, pivot from there. Uh, yeah, root cause can certainly get into laws of physics. Um, and if you're saying, "Hey, I want to go to Mars," <laughs> then yeah, it's probably going to need to. Uh, we're going to need to challenge some some assumptions. Um, I want to go back to the breaking the problem down. Um, you know, so Toyota's eight-step problem solving that's that's commonly taught sort of teaches to find the problem and then break it down. And I often start breaking a problem down very early before it's well-defined. And, and that's sort of how you described it. And, and I think my reason for that, not that we can't break it down further later, is that when we when we don't when we don't break it down early, we end up defining a problem that has a whole bunch of unrelated things in it 
Um, and, and so it's almost impossible to break down later because it was too broadly defined to start. So just, you know, your experience about breaking the problem down before it's defined or after defined, you know, what's been your learning journey or experiences around that? So I think a few things is one is I think having really strong collaboration. So when we're talking about big problems that we need to break down further is making sure that you have the right people in the conversation from the beginning. And what I find is that across large organizations, people have such different views and different viewpoints and expertise that uh, getting those people together up front can save a whole lot of heartache when a month from now or a week from now, now you're really in the, into the nitty gritty of problem solving. And suddenly someone introduces a facet that we hadn't considered before. Right. So I think that's really important is making sure you have the right people in the room. And then I also think uh, filtering as, as a CI professional, if you will, or whoever's facilitating it, uh, filtering out opinion versus facts and in that early stage it's really common to have we just don't know but i think that you have to be open and honest and say this is what i think it is but okay we'll add it to stuff we don't know and we need to go find out or stuff that we don't know and we're never going to be able to find out and we just have to work around it yeah no i love that because it's you know we're not we're not looking to understand everything we probably can't and it's okay not to know everything, right? No one does. So, so let's stop pretending that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have everything, everything understood well. So, um, so, so, you know, you, you've, you've been in a lot of different roles in problem solving. You, you, you've taught it, you've facilitated it, you've done it. Uh, do you have examples of, of poorly done problem solving and what's been your lessons from those experiences? Yeah. So, I think I'm going to take a slightly different track than you may expect. So when it comes to the title of your recent book, People Solve Problems, uh, I think a lot of the emphasis gets put on the problems and not as much emphasis on the people. And so I think that when it comes to people and problem solving is it's really important, or I found the greatest success, I'll say, is working with people who are passionate about the problem. And so... I think as leaders within an organization, we want to make sure that we're working on problems that are not only important, but also problems that people are passionate about. And I think that's especially important for people who are relatively new or junior to problem solving. So going back to your original question of poor problem solving, uh, I distinctly remember a problem that a team was brought together to work on and I was asked to lead them. And at first they seemed interested, uh, but maybe midway through that problem solving process, I realized they really weren't interested in uh, problem solving. And they had told me something wasn't a root cause when two weeks ago, they told me it was a root cause. So it became pretty evident to me that they weren't really invested in solving that problem. And a lot of time and resources were wasted working with this group when we probably could have worked with a different set of people on the same problem and gotten better results. Yeah, I think that's that's interesting because it's it's uh, there's a lot of the analytical side of us wants to say, go find the biggest problem or uh, the most critical problem or the one that's going to lead to the biggest uh, leap forward. Um, but but you're kind of saying, well, that's that's a secondary filter almost to do people care about the problem? Or are they passionate about investing their energy? Um do you, do you find it in 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 that pursuit of passion for problem solving do you end up working on stuff that doesn't matter or does it still always matter it just might not be the biggest problem that's a good question and i think it the the typical answer is it depends so i think that it depends on who you're working with so if you're working with a more junior person I much prefer to work on a problem that they're passionate about because I want to get them through the problem solving process as quickly as possible. And usually passion leads to energy, which leads to progress and momentum. Mm -hmm. And then we get through a small problem that they're passionate about so that we, we can build skill. 
we always have to work on the big problems within an organization. And I think uh, that's where as senior leaders, we need to inspire people, which is I know is easier said than done. But when it comes to the big problems, uh, senior leaders, we need to inspire people to some of the big problems and uh, give them the opportunity, clear out enough space and give them uh, the safety of actually experimenting. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's well said around the, part of the role of the senior leaders, right, is at, at, you know, helping engage people in the problems that are not easily solved, right? They're not, they're not, uh, uh, they're going to take some effort. Nobody may see a path forward. It might require more collaboration, but you need to create the right permissions, time, energy, kind of a, a commitment that we're going to work through the, the barriers found. Um, I think being a sponsor, a good sponsor of problem solving uh, may be a part of my book that was underdone. <laughs> um, I, I do have a chapter kind of around that, but um, but th there's so much to being a good sort of sponsor of, of, of those efforts that th yeah. there's a lot that that needs to happen there. So, um, so, so you've done a lot of coaching and, and you know, just building off of that, I'd almost love to think both up and down, <laughs> you know, because I, I I, I like that distinction, right? Who are you? Who are you working with? That's going to change how you approach things. Is it senior leaders? Is it somebody new to problem solving? So when you think about coaching, um, you know, how do you assess the person you're coaching, and and or the team you're coaching, right? So you've already talked a bit about their mindset. Like, are they passionate about it? But their skills, their capabilities, their uh, their their culture. How, how do you go about assessing in your your role as a coach? So uh, I think the first question is, what am I trying to coach that person towards? And I think that depends on the person. In some cases, they might have a really clear place of where they want to be. And so that's really easy as a coach that, hey, I can help you get there. I think sometimes I need to ask thought-provoking questions to lead someone towards this is where we could go. And I think that's really common when it comes to coaching senior leaders in improvement. Uh, I also think that part of my style is being really pragmatic. So while you and I are super passionate about continuous improvement and we can talk about all the finer principles of lean and, and those things, there's some people that aren't as passionate. And so I think tying it back to uh, this is a capability that we don't have. And I want to coach you towards having this capability. And this is how it's going to help you personally and or the business. Uh, that can be a pretty compelling reason to say, let's go on this journey together. That's really interesting. So I, I, I think pragmatism is, is an important. It's something I've always uh, uh, tried to pride myself on, right? I'll probably fail at, fail at it sometimes, but uh, especially coaching people new to it, um, to be pragmatic, you kind of have to uh, uh, you have to accept that your problem solving efforts will be far from best in class. Right? They aren't going to meet the ideal standard of problem solving. So how do you maintain a vision of what good problem solving looks like and and push people towards that ideal good problem solving while remaining pragmatic while taking that pragmatic bent? So, I think that one in the spirit of continuous improvement is just instilling that we can always do a better job and it's okay for us to talk about what could have gone better. I think some cultures are better at that than others. And I think uh, for usually like an American audience, uh, the majority of people that I've worked with are in the US, they, uh, are, they tend to want to focus on the positives. We're a very kind of optimistic culture, which is great, right? But when it comes to improvement, we have to say, what can we do better? And so I think, uh, I think creating a, a conversation about what can we do better in after, after something has happened, use that as a coaching point. I also think storytelling can be really powerful. So uh, provide someone an example of of what really good problem solving looks like. What are what what are some of the key parts of that story that enabled that success that people can take with them into future opportunities? 
I, I like that a lot because it's it's not just analyzing your your failures, quote unquote, uh, in problem solving, but more aspiring to, you know, what better could look like and, and using stories to help paint the picture of that 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 improvement path. So um, fantastic. Well, you know, in, in the spirit of pragmatism, you shared a lot of, you know, really pragmatic nuggets and uh, you know, your your story and your example is uh, great for us all to learn from. So John, thanks for coming on and sharing your your lessons learned. And thank you so much for having me, Jamie. Thanks for listening to the People Solve Problems podcast. Let's keep the conversation going. Visit jflinch.com for more episodes and other content. And continue to join us on your podcast app, of course. We greatly appreciate your feedback through reviews and ratings. Consider expanding your understanding of problem solving with Jamie's book, People Solve Problems, The Power of Every Person, Every Day, Every Problem. Available on Amazon. Until next time, keep learning, innovating, and solving problems.